I need to start off this video by letting you know one crucial detail. This movie is one of my favorite films, like ever. I'm not making this video to rip into it, and I'm not making it to say that the story doesn't work. I'm simply here to make this video to point out details from the original that didn't translate into this movie. The story has a very clear message when it comes to understanding the world that the characters live in, while a work of fiction, certain number of rules that are bound to themselves when it comes to how the story is told. Realistic Realistically, the elements that I will be talking about today were the things that really broke the immersion for me, even as a child viewing the story. It took me out of the narrative. It broke the suture for me, even as a child viewing this story, and that's coming from a story freak, which is really hard to do. Is it possible that I'm the only one who thinks about this stuff? Maybe, maybe not. But it is a notable discussion point when it comes to reworking things into something that sticks to its rules. What exactly am I talking about? Let me explain. Don Bluth. You know him, even if you don't think that you do. Bluth is an American animator responsible for such films as The Land Before Time, An American Tale, All Dogs Go to Heaven, and the subject of today's video being the 1982 film The Secret of Nim, an adaptation of the Newbery Medal-winning book from 1971 entitled Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, written by author Robert C. O'Brien. This animated dark fantasy adventure film was the directorial debut of Bluth, who in 1979 had left his animation job at Walt Disney Studios along with nine other animators to start their own animation company. I consider this film to be a quintessential kids movie. It's dark and terrifying at times, but this film creates a story of wonder, excitement, and courage, all from the perspective of a mouse. The plot of the novel and the movie are pretty much in the same basket, the only real exception being the main protagonist, whose name was changed to Mrs. Brisby, with a B, to avoid copyright troubles with Whammo. They're the ones that make Frisbees. Apart from that, the synopsis reads like this. Mrs. Frisbee, a widowed mouse, must move her family out of their home from the field before the local farmer begins to plow. Unable to leave because her son has fallen ill, Mrs. Frisbee seeks the help of nearby rats, who have heightened intelligence after being the subject of scientific experiments. Soon, Mrs. Frisbee is caught in a conflict among the rats, jeopardizing her mission to save her family. There is no mistaking that the novel and the Don Bluth film are considered classics while having tonal differences from one another. Whenever I hear someone use the phrase, oh, it's a kid's movie, who cares? I bring up the secret of Nim as a counter argument. It doesn't talk down to the audience or try to sell you anything. What this film does is show that courage can be used to achieve your goals, that even the smallest of mice can have the biggest of hearts. And what it does is showcase a story that a child could witness and enjoy, as well as older audiences can watch and get a completely different vibe from it, but still enjoy it all the same. I've developed a term for this phenomenon, and I call it matured narrative understanding, with the definition being this. When elements of a story witnessed as a child are more understandable when they are witnessing the same story as an adult. Examples of this phenomenon would be when you watch The Lion King. During the Be Prepared musical sequences, there are visual elements tied to World War II, informing you who and what this character is within the story. How about Who Framed Roger Rabbit, a film that on the surface was about people and cartoons living in the same world, until you got a little older and discovered that the story was an amplification on segregation. Now, these movies don't lead with these ideas. They're kept underneath the surface so that they reveal themselves over time. Some people will pick up on these elements really quickly, but it's usually older audience members that pick up on it first, rather than the children who these movies are supposedly aimed for. Now, why do I bring all these up when talking about The Secret of Nim? Well, I bring them up because it's going to lead into the way that we're going to rework things for this story. The story of the novel and the films have elements of matured narrative understanding, being Nicodemus explaining what happened to the rats and mice while they were being held at the Institute of Mental Health, referred to as NIM. The way things are put into perspective through exposition, what these animals were put through that transformed them into the characters that they become is otherworldly. However, when you get a little older, you start to realize that what they went through was rigorous amount of genetic testings that happened with lab rats and rat mice, like things for medication and chemical reactions between the 1970s and the 1980s. When you're a kid, you witness these scenes, you have a feeling sort of along 
along the lines of, Oh no, those poor animals! But when you get a little older, your perspective changes. And now you're thinking things like, Holy crap, I think I actually know what's going on here. However, and this is a really big however for me, there are two things I could never get over when it came to the Don Bluth film. I watched the movie when I was in elementary school, and I read the novel when I was in middle school, and it became super clear what elements were changed and added for the film. First, the film contains magic. Second, the film introduced a new magical plot-centric item, being the amulet, that A, is never actually given a real narrative drive, and B, acts as a deus ex machina that for some reason just fixes the random issue that presents itself at the end of the film. These two things really take me out of the narrative. Why? Simple. For a story about science and technology that we got from the novel, it makes little to no sense why the concept of magic needed to be thrown in. I'd like to take a moment and to actually go into both of these topics and break down why they don't work as well as they could. First off, the magic situation. Magic in and of itself isn't a problem, but it needs to make sense for the story that you're telling. Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim is within a world based in science and technology. The Don Bluth film stays mostly true to this element, but in order to make the story different, the writers structured it to have magic. The change was so impactful that in 1983, one year after the film came out, a school of students who had read the book as an assignment actually wrote a letter to the production house. A book entitled The Animated Films of Don Bluth, written by author John Cawley, manages to chronicle this interaction in a section dedicated to the secret of Nim. A link to this can be found in the description below. It's a fascinating look into the world of Don Bluth films. The school wrote to question why magic was added to the narrative, in particular why one of the rat characters, named Nicodemus, was changed to a wizard for the film adaptation. Three producers, John Pomeroy, Gary Goldman, and Will Finn, wrote their reply with the following statement, quote, Nicodemus was changed to a wizard to create more mystery around Nicodemus and the entire rat colony. This change is just weird. Some fans argue that the rats are so advanced and have developed things beyond the realm of understanding, that others would perceive what they do as magical, or that it's some kind of beyond higher level technology. Some will even bring up the quote from famed science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, who said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I have had countless debates on this subject regarding the secret of Nim, most of them in resulting in people telling me that Nicodemus has harnessed a science that grants him psychokinesis, the power to move objects purely with the power of the mind. Now, in theory, this is a fun concept to dive into, and as it is, the movie that we have is one that you will always be able to use this concept for. All I want to do is see if we can't give a different interpretation to how the story could have been adapted in a different way that doesn't dive into the realms of science fiction or fantasy. Speaking of fantasy, let's address the amulet. I'm sure most die-hard Don Bluth fans probably know this information, but for those who don't, the amulet was something that was invented for the film and was never from the original novel. This was another thing that the school had written to the production house to question, to which the producers had said, quote, The amulet was a device, or a symbol to represent the internal power of Mrs. Brisby. It was also a gift from her husband, a sign of love. The stone slash amulet has no power itself. It was only when Mrs. Brisby's strength was employed that it became a force, an extension of Mrs. Brisby, a vision visual extension of her internal power. While this is an honorable idea, it doesn't excuse the fact that the amulet acts as a deus ex machina, which is something like an event, character, ability, or item that randomly comes into play and fixes the seemingly unfixable issue suddenly and unexpectedly. Sure, we're told the amulet has power, but we never know how or why. And to make this even weirder, the producers had even admitted that this super important plot device that they introduced into their narrative was never actually going to be explained. In an article entitled Remembering Nim, written by author Adam McDaniel in 2003, they said the following statement, quote, We really didn't think it necessary to explain it further. It seems like it would have eaten up too much screen time to tell the history of the amulet when the story was about this innocent widowed mouse. And that really bothers me about the whole concept of the amulet as a whole. It's a thing that comes out of nowhere, does some unexplainable stuff for some reason, and it was never going to be explained 
Why? We'll never know. And if you want to read the whole article for yourself, it too is located in the description. The idea of the amulet is a noble one. It helps younger audiences personify the power of Mrs. Brisby's determination. However, in terms of story structure, the amulet is usually a sour spot for people because of its so being out of place. In the novel, there are two issues that the protagonists deal with, moving the Frisbee house and the rats having enough time to escape the scientists that would be there for them soon. While Mrs. Frisbee is captured in the farmhouse, she overhears the farmers talking about the NIM scientists and how they were going to arrive. The level of suspense is that Mrs. Frisbee might never escape or see her children again, and she's the only one who knows the scientists are coming for the rats. Even if they move the house, it might not be enough time for them to escape properly, because the NIM scientists would find all of the stuff found within the colony that the rats were working on, leading to an investigation that would never see the rats hiding safely ever again. This is enough of a climax to where it would leave you on the edge of your seat. Did Mrs. Frisbee just cause the death of all of these super intelligent rats, as well as orphan her children? The point is, the inclusion of magic and the amulet were elements made up for the Don Bluth film. The concept of the inclusion of magic into the narrative has been debated for decades. It was recently brought up again in 2015 when MGM announced that they were going to be making a reboot series based on The Secret of Nim to make a CGI live-action hybrid that was supposedly going to be entitled Nim Origins, which could follow the rats and mice while they were at Nim and their plans to outsmart the scientists to escape. To make things even weirder, it was also going to be a jump start to reboot the series as a franchise. The sequels were then going to be based on the other books within the Nim series that were written by O'Brien. While it isn't inherently a bad idea, when you do these these whole mentalities that are all about trying to start a cinematic universe or a giant franchise means that you're no longer thinking about the story at present. Instead, you're thinking four to five steps ahead. What happens when the movie comes out that's supposed to be based off of Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim? There's a point where Nicodemus explains to Mrs. Frisbee who the rats are and their connection to her late husband. Are they going to explain all the again? Wouldn't that be a waste of time? Are they going to actually put an asterisk in the corner of the film telling viewers if they want to learn more, they can buy by Nim Origins on Blu-ray. For this video and rework, I wanted to challenge myself to show how you can add and change things in a way that doesn't hurt the original source material, but rather builds on it and makes it something new. I want to take the concepts of the Don Bluth film and the original novel and see if I can't craft it into the sum of both parts. For the ease of continuity, I'm going to keep the name Brisby for this rework. I don't want to get in a legal battle with Whammo over the name. Something tells me their lawyers are armed with military-grade throwing discs. <laughs> Is that even legal? No, thank you. My first challenge is to reimagine how Mrs. Brisby perceives what is going on with the rats that, to her, is otherworldly. Just writing out the magic stuff from the original Don Bluth film was too easy for me. I want to keep this wondrous aspect in the story. Apart from the anecdotes from her late husband, Mrs. Brisby doesn't know what these sciency, techy things are. This is all new to her. And we can take that one step further. What if the fantastical things that the rats are doing only only appear supernatural to Mrs. Brisby, something that in the eyes of a child could appear like magic, but with age and experience you'd come to learn what it really was. Can we strategically write in mature narrative understanding? My second challenge is to add a narrative element to the mice of Nim. Nothing that breaks away from how we understand characters like Mr. Ages. What I'm doing is calling attention to something that's actually been under our noses this whole time and take the opportunity to craft it into something altogether new that makes sense for what they can do and utilize for this story. Believe me, it's actually kind of fascinating this choice wasn't thought of sooner. My final challenge to myself is a bit of a tricky one. I'm going to keep the amulet in the story. Rather than just writing it out, what if we changed what it was? Perhaps a producer said that the amulet was required for this rewrite. How can we change it into something that matches the story that we're making here and give it a reason for it being here in the first place? So, rethink the magic, reimagine the mice of Nim, reinvent the amulet, all while reworking the the characters and story that is faithful to the original source material while diving into deeper elements that were established from the Don Bluth film and even hinted at in the novels. Scrub up everyone, it's gonna be a long procedure, so let us begin the operation.
let's talk about how rats use technology in a way that makes it seem like it's supernatural. Nothing drastic, it should never take you out of the story. The reason why we think these things are otherworldly is because we're seeing them through the eyes of Mrs. Brisby. She's a bright character in her own right, she just hasn't had the exposure to these things. Because it's her perspective, she has a small window into understanding what these things are, and so do we. Is it possible that we could rewrite the magical sequences to make them something else? For example, when Nicodemus is writing the details on the death of Jonathan Brisby in the film, he's clearly using a magical pen and ink to write. Can we change this into something that has a technological or sciency influence? An idea that came to my mind was, instead of writing it down, Nicodemus could be recording his narration in an audio diary. Something you could hide in the background so you don't directly see it. The lights of the recorder, blinking red, slowly illuminate the room to show objects scattered around. After he's done speaking, the light turns off and the room goes dark. Then suddenly, one of the walls suddenly grows to a blinding brightness. In this light, we now see the room is full of books of different sizes. Giant, enormous books form shelves for even smaller ones. Nicodemus is facing into the light, holding a walking stick in one hand. We only see his silhouette against the light. A group of rats are removing the recorder from out of the room. After they leave, one rat remains. He reaches into his satchel and pulls out a small little jewel-like object in a clear case with a beaded string to make a necklace. He wanted to make sure that this went to his wife, said the rat, and it walks over and places the necklace on a table. Thank you, Justin, says Nicodemus. We'll have Mr. Aegis deliver it to her. There's a pause. The rat looks at Nicodemus. Nicodemus, what do we do about his family? The rest of the Brisbees are not like us. They need not be worried by the plan. The plan won't be ready until next summer. I just mean, Justin sighs. Jonathan died doing this for us. Don't we owe it to him at least to look after them until then? Nicodemus doesn't answer. Justin sighs. He walks out the door and stops in the entryway. All I'm saying, Nicodemus, none of us would be here without him. And with that, Justin closes the door behind him. Nicodemus turns to the door, and we can see an eye patch over his left eye. His shoulders slouch as he lets out a soft sigh and whispers, I know, Justin. Nicodemus taps his walking stick to the ground, and just like that, the light goes out. I think having Nicodemus recording his notes verbally like a doctor or a scientist would would be a nice little element that connects to the science that we'll see in the story. But what if you want Nicodemus writing in a journal or a diary? Well, a fun thing you could do is make the ink thermochromic. For those who don't know, ink that is thermochromic means that when it is exposed to high levels of heat, the ink turns transparent. Once it's invisible, the ink can then be put in a cold environment and it reveals itself again. After Nicodemus is done writing, he picks up the book and places it in a large collection of candles. The words disappear from the heat, another rat comes over, closes the book, and takes it away. I think that's pretty sciency, don't you think? It would make for a cool reveal later. Pun very much intended. And don't worry, I'll bring that up when we get there. It's at this time that we'll also answer what exactly that big wall of light was, and how Nicodemus was able to make it go away by tapping his walking stick to the ground. It's a fun sense of misdirection. And also, just so you know, I'm referring to the stone slash amulet object in this story as the necklace from now on, just to make it a little bit easier and for difference's sake. The story then shifts to following Mrs. Brisby, who will be wearing the necklace for the majority of the story. Something worth mentioning early on is that Jonathan's death was something that happened a little over a year ago, and you can do it in a way that makes it feel organic. It can be brought up when Mrs. Brisby goes to visit Mr. Ages. The reason I feel it should be mentioned in the story is because it was never really addressed in the Don Bluth film. When we meet Ages for the first time, he says, I'm sorry about your husband's death. Which makes you think that it happened fairly recently. Yet, for something that happened recently, the family who lost their father or their husband feel really well adjusted. By having a time frame stated, we can see how the family has been slowly moving on since they lost a family member, as well as inform me that the scene with Nicodemus and Justin that we saw a little bit ago took place over a year ago. An element that I recommend that we add is showing Timothy Brisby's sickness. I have to give credit to the book in this regard because because it showed you how sick he was. You watched him get slowly worse. This stems from a very particular element of storytelling known as show, don't tell. A very high rule of thumb when writing any story. Don't just tell us somebody is feeling something. Captivate us by showing how it is making them physically. After hearing the description of Timothy in the Don Bluth film, you'd expect him to be a mess, but when we actually see him, he doesn't really look that sick. Heck, this boy just looks tired. You could start off the story with Mrs. Brisby and Oliver 
children out gathering food. We see that Timothy is trying to stay active and engaging, but he rapidly gets worse until he finally collapses in a fit of coughing and has to be carried home. When they get there, he's dripping with sweat and is constantly coughing. Timothy is put to bed and Mrs. Brisby tells her children that she's going to see Mr. Ages to see if he can help. This small little narrative choice allows the audience to see the direness of the situation that kicks off the story that then transitions into Mrs. Brisby meeting with Mr. Ages. In the movie, Mr. Ages lives in an old broken down threshing machine, while in the book he lives in a shoebox. I actually want to do a combination of both. His house is the shoebox, but his lab is inside the threshing machine. Mrs. Brisby visits the shoebox, and when Ages doesn't answer, she begins to look in through one of the windows. Suddenly, there's a booming noise from inside of the threshing machine, and she realizes that Ages is probably in there, and she is not comfortable going anywhere near this thing. She'd have a small line of dialogue to boost her confidence, something like, Jonathan went in there all the time. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. As she then makes her way towards the machine. For Ages, I'm pulling more influence from the novel. He's a lot nicer and is willing to help Mrs. Frisbee with the problem. I always thought that the version of Ages from the Don Bluth film was a little too prickly. Now, I understand what the writers were doing. He has a very high intelligence, which makes him a very antisocial shut-in. He's very bothered by the smaller problems of the people around him. But I feel like making him nicer is a little bit more of an interesting experience. We can make him a little different from the novel by giving him a quirk to where he always tries to explain what he's doing, but he's using jargon that makes him sound like he's speaking a different language. And he has to apologize and give a more simplified version or an exampled version so that the character understands what it is that he's going on about in a way that is approachable for the individual. Mr. Ages and Mrs. Brisby meet and he takes her towards his lab. Along the way, he apologizes for the booming noise, saying, I've been trying to get this combustion boiler idea off the ground, but I can make a consistent temperature for proper melting points for a project that I have when I want to get started. But this engine keeps regulating temperature by expelling large amounts of heat in random intervals, causing all that confounded noise. Ages turns to see Mrs. Brisby's puzzled look. He smiles sheepishly. Sorry, sorry, force of habit. He then stops and points at the engine stationed above his lab. I'm trying to get it to be a new brewing system for me, but it keeps choking out and making all that noise. Is it kind of like when you put too much wood in a fireplace and it can put itself out? Mr. Ages smiles widely. Precisely, Mrs. Brisby, precisely. Mrs. Brisby begins to tell Mr. Ages about Timothy's condition and how he suddenly got worse very quickly. As he listens, Mr. Ages brings Mrs. Brisby into a different room off of his lab, an area full of tiny little drawers on every single wall that reach all the way to the ceiling, a ladder on each wall to access the high drawers. On every drawer, there's a little brass handle with a little written label above the handle. In the center of the room, there's a table covered in glass jars and other random items that Mrs. Brisby doesn't quite recognize, like a Bunsen burner. She has no idea what that is, but it looks really fancy. She looks wide-eyed around the room. My word, what is all of this? Oh, something Jonathan put together for me. He read about apothecaries in the 18th century and made this system for me. I was always setting things down and forgetting where I put them, so he wanted to get this all made for me. Ages walks over to one of the drawers and points at the label. Organized everything, left to right, floor to ceiling. Mrs. Brisby walks over to the drawer. Sure enough, it was her husband's handwriting on the label. She reads it out loud. Which Hazel? Mr. Ages nods. We learned about that flower a long time ago, and it comes in handy from time to time. Mrs. Brisby looks around the room again, seeing that her husband's handwriting is all around her, labeling things that she could read, like spices and herbs, and words that she's never seen before in her life. Her smile is one of melancholy. Mr. Ages walks over and places a hand on her shoulder. How are you all holding up over there? Oh, we're all right. It's been a year, but we miss him all the same. Well, I'm sure he'd be tickled pink to know that you still wear his necklace. And I always will. Well, we can reminisce on another day. So, tell me what's wrong with Timothy. Brisby begins to explain what Timothy's sickness was and how it suddenly shifted into this fever, the sweating, the constant chill, and the ferocious cough. Ages begins to swiftly move around the room, ascending ladders, grabbing things from a drawer high above, and sliding back down again, and putting everything on the table. Ages deduces that Timothy must have pneumonia. He begins working on a remedy. He even asks Mrs. Brisby to come over and use a mortar and pestle to grind up the ingredients he's been gathering. The entire time Ages is describing what he's grabbing and what they do, and why Timothy needs to stay in bed for a few weeks with this remedy. Ages then goes to the other side of the table and grabs a Bunsen burner and brings it over with a small vial of water attached to a mechanical arm, and he stations the vial over the flame of the Bunsen burner. Imagine this vial is Timothy's body. The sickness is the water inside, and the flame is the body's ability to fight off a sickness. Ages then moves the arm 
arm and swirls the vial around. If Timothy is up and moving around, the healing will take longer. Aegis locks down the vial over the flame, walks over to the other side of the table, and grabs a small pinch of weird green powder and walks back. What we're making is going to kick his body into overdrive. He then throws the powder onto the Bunsen burner flame, which grows and even changes color. Almost instantly, the water starts to boil and steam rises. The fever will break first, but that does not mean he's better, and he needs to stay in bed. Mrs. Brisby nods, and the two of them continue to work on making the medicine. Showing Age's evaluation of Timothy's sickness and the creation of the remedy showcases the element that I wish either the novel or the film really would have taken advantage of. This is how I plan on tackling the second challenge I set for myself, reimagining the mice of Nim and what they can do. We all know that the rats harness their intelligence and workshop it into engineering and technology, but what about the mice of Nim, being Mr. Ages and Jonathan Brisby? The novel never actually tells you what happened to the mice, only that their situation was similar to the rats. What if that was only mostly true? The experiment was the same, but the environments were different. What if the mice had a different set of skills that they picked up that the rats never did? And like I said, it's not something completely out of nowhere. It's actually been there from the beginning. When we first meet Mr. Ages, we perceive him as a doctor because how he's able to diagnose Timothy's sickness. What if that was only part of it? What if Mr. Ages, and by extension, Jonathan Brisby, were fluent in chemistry? Ever wonder why the rats have Mr. Ages make the sleeping powder for the cat? The reason why the rats can't put together their own mixture is because they literally don't know how. This dynamic element is added to the mice of Nim in a way that makes sense. The rats rats are engineers, the mice are chemists. While the rats are figuring out how to unlock doors and build contraptions, the mice are taking in and watching what the scientists are doing to the other animals. We'll continue this conversation about this chemistry idea when we get to Nicodemus explaining to Mrs. Brisby who the rats are, what Nim was, and their connection to Mrs. Brisby's husband and Mr. Ages. The next change involves the tractor. In the book, the plow breaking down was purely coincidental. The farmer starts it up and it just breaks. In the movie, Mrs. Brisby tries to stop the tractor, only to have Auntie Shrew swoop in and save her by cutting the fuel line. We're never told how long it'll actually take to fix the plow. We only have a quick line from Mrs. Brisby who says, he'll come back tomorrow. I think the tractor sabotage from the film is a better narrative choice, rather than it just breaking down. But I believe we can change it so that it's more inclusive to Mrs. Brisby, and it starts right after she gets Timothy's medicine from Mr. Ages. Mrs. Brisby and Ages stand on top of the threshing machine, and they can see the farm Farmer Fitzgibbons working on the plow. It can't be moving day already. Ages turns to her. No, no, he's just making sure that it works after the long winter. She turns to Ages. But that means he's going to use it soon, right? Ages frowns. Oh yes, that does still present a problem. Mrs. Brisby looks at the threshing machine. Well, you work inside of here. Is there any way that you could? But Ages shakes his head. Ma'am, I only use this machine for its heat source. That plow is a completely different beast. I don't know how it works. Mrs. Brisby sighs in discontent. Just then, Mr. Age's ears perk up, like a light bulb went off in his head as he repeats himself, I don't know how it works. He then turns to Mrs. Brisby. Mrs. Brisby, I have to go. You get home and make sure that Timothy takes this medicine as soon as he can. I'll be in touch. And before she can reply, Mr. Age suddenly climbs down the threshing machine and disappears into the tall grass. Mrs. Brisby looks at the plow in the distance, the medicine pouch in her hands, and makes her way back home. On her way there, we're introduced to Jeremy the Crow. The interaction with Jeremy Jeremy is quite similar to the film and to the book, so choosing which one that you would like to use is up to you. Granted, Jeremy as a character is wildly different in both versions. In the novel, he's a younger crow and is just more naive about things than other characters. In the film, he's much more of a goofball and is played for laughs. I'm going to use the novel inspiration and then sprinkle some humor thrown in there when it makes sense. In both versions, Mrs. Brisby finds a crow tangled up in string and helps him escape while the farm cat, Dragon, slowly creeps up on them. In the book, Jeremy flies away with Mrs. Frisbee on his back in order to get away. It was changed in the movie to add suspense. The filmmakers wanted a chase scene, so they wrote one in, and they wanted to show how much of a threat Dragon was, and they did so very well, good lord, this cat is terrifying. The movie removes the flyaway scene to establish that Mrs. Frisbee has a fear of heights. If you want to keep this element of her character intact, it's completely up to you. I say we have a small chase scene after a conversation with Mrs. Frisbee and Jeremy. She's telling Jeremy to stop making all that noise while she frees himself, as it's only gonna try to get Dragon's attention. Jeremy's embarrassed to admit that the string was for a love nest and getting tangled was not part of the plan. Mrs. Brisby, as she bites the pieces of string, asked if Jeremy had somebody in mind for this nest. He says that he does, although he hasn't found her.
her yet. Mrs. Brisby smiles and rolls her eyes. Jeremy sits still while he's untied, allowing Mrs. Brisby to walk around and politely allows her to climb over and untangle the string. He goes on and on about the loveness until he suddenly stops when he spots the necklace, commenting that Mrs. Brisby has a sparkly. A what? Mrs. Brisby asks. Jeremy gestures to the necklace. A sparkly! Right there! Oh, I gotta get me one of those! Where'd you get it? Mrs. Brisby keeps untangling while she talks. It would belong to my husband. It, he always had it with him, as far back as I can remember knowing him. You'd rarely see him without it. And if you asked him what it was, he'd always say the same thing. Mrs. Brisby then holds a lump of string and brandishes it in front of her. It brings me luck, and as long as I have luck, I'll never be stuck. Mrs. Brisby dons a sad smile. He always told others that one of the best examples of it bringing him luck was the day the two of us met. Mrs. Brisby stands quietly. Jeremy breaks the silence by saying, It's like a love nest that you can wear. Mrs. Brisby smiles a little bit wider. I suppose it is. Jeremy nods and stares off into the distance. Well, if I had a sparkly like that, I'd go to the top of the highest tree I could find and Miss Wright would find me in no time. I could just scream out, Here I am! Just then, the sound of a snapping twig causes both Mrs. Brisby and Jeremy to freeze. They turn to see that group of tall grass was slowly being parted by something, and whatever it was, it was coming right for them. And shortly after, our chase sequence begins with Dragon, which leads Mrs. Brisby to the top of a tree. Jeremy is swooping at Dragon to allow Mrs. Brisby to climb faster. When she reaches the top, Jeremy circles around the tree and yells to her to jump and that he'll fly her to safety. After a moment of hesitation spurred on by the fact that Dragon is about to pounce, Mrs. Brisby has no choice and leaps out and lands on Jeremy's back, leaving Dragon stranded in the tree, meowing helplessly. Jeremy cheers, but Mrs. Brisby just buries her face into Jeremy's feathers and just clings on to dear life to the little bit of string that was still wrapped around him. He asks where she lives. He'd be more than happy to take her home. She asks Jeremy to go to the rock out in the middle of the farm field. She lives nearby there. When they land, they have a nice little moment atop the rock for formal introductions while Mrs. Brisby finishes untangling Jeremy from the string. They thank each other for saving each other's lives. Mrs. B, if you ever need my help, you just let me know. I'll be there in no time. Mrs. Brisby chuckles. And how would I let you know, Jeremy? Yell your name? That'd get Dragon over here in no time. Jeremy thinks for a moment, and then has an idea. Well, you just leave something sparkly on top of this rock, and I'll know you're looking for me. I love sparkly things. They are my favorite things. Mrs. Brisby agrees, and the two of them go their separate ways. Jeremy to the air, and Mrs. Brisby slides down the rock and makes her way to her cement block home. A, a few days go by. The morning that Timothy's fever breaks, the Brisby family shares a collective sigh of relief. They're not out of the woods yet, but at least he's not going to be sweating as hard as he was. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door. Mrs. Brisby opens it to find the Shrew, who they call Auntie Shrew, who immediately lets herself in. Going on and on about how Ages just told her to go to the Brisby house and she has no idea why she's there. After a few moments, Mr. Ages suddenly arrives, carrying a large piece of blue paper, and on it is a diagram of the tractor. Mrs. Brisby tries asking where he got it, but he just shakes her off, saying it wasn't important. He then tells Auntie Shrew and Mrs. Brisby that the three of them are going to go wreck the tractor to stop the plow. Good heavens! How on earth are two mice and a shrew going to do that? declares the shrew. Mr. Ages attempts to break down the plan and with a ton of details, but when the two of the others just stare at him blankly, he explains that they're going to remove a fuel line so that the tractor can't run, and it could take the farmer some time to get it fixed. Mr. Ages explains that the three of them are going to take this day to go over the blueprints to figure out what they need to do and where to go to get the job done, and tomorrow they'll go out and take out the tractor in the morning. Just then, there's a muffled sound, followed by a steady rumbling noise. The farmer, the farmer's tractor had just come to life. Moving day was today. Or we could do it now, Mr. Ages says, rolling up the blueprint and shoving it into his bag. The shrew proclaims, I'm, you're out of your mind if you think I'm going anywhere near that thing. Mrs. Brisby tells the shrew to look after her children and instructs the nearby animals to spread the word about moving day. Without a moment to lose, Ages and Brisby leave for the house and sprint across the field towards the tractor as fast as they could. When they get there, they climb onto the tractor just as it starts to move. Mr. Ages tells Brisby that the farmer is going to take a loop around the outside of the field to make sure that the wheels are working before he moves into the field. They only have a few minutes to look over the papers. Mr. Ages hands the diagram to Mrs. Brisby and quickly runs down the plan about removing on wires and clamps and hoses. Just then, the tractor hits a rock, sending Mr. Ages off to the side and into the tall grass below. He tries to climb back up, but the tractor is speeding up, and he 
he only can run behind it, yelling to Mrs. Brisby to get to the engine and falls out of sight. Mrs. Brisby has no time to panic. She places the blueprints in her mouth and climbs around the outside of the tractor. She's able to get to the location, just underneath the gas tank. She looks at the blueprints, which are covered in blocks of words she doesn't recognize, and the sound of the engine roaring is making it hard to focus. Instead, she holds up the blueprints and looks at the illustration lines to the engine, memorizing which line and which wire was which. The tractor swerves after a moment, and Mrs. Brisby looks out and sees that the tractor is heading for the field. She casts the blueprint aside and runs out and starts yanking out cables and casting them aside. The tractor sounds like it's winding down, but it isn't losing speed. There's only one thing left, the main fuel line. No matter how hard she pulled, it wouldn't budge. In a moment of pure desperation, Mrs. Brisby pulls the line tight and bites down with it with all of her might, right into the line, ripping it in half. Almost instantly, the tractor putters to a stop. The voice of the farmer is heard from above. Ah, oh, jeez, I knew I forgot to fill the tank. Mrs. Brisby looks as the farmer climbs off the tractor and heads towards his shed. Mrs. Brisby slumps down to catch her breath. Mr. Ages climbs up and is giddy with excitement. He scrunches his nose and laughs that she reeks of gasoline. He reaches into his satchel and removes a small little bag. Baking soda. Mix it with a bath and that smell will come right out. I never leave home without it. He tells Mrs. Brisby that the metal hose clamp was the reason why she couldn't pull the line free. He tells her that if she pinches the two ears together that it would come loose. Aegis says he's going to look on the other side of the tractor engine to see if he couldn't assess the damage that was done. Mrs. Brisby climbs up and removes the clamp, but she's caught off guard when she spots a series of rats who appear to be moving along wire from underneath the house in the distance. Before she can really even think a moment about it, Mr. Ages runs up and tells her to hide. Just as they duck down, Farmer Fitzgibbons looks into the engine, sees the damage, and exclaims in frustration. They listen as the farmer calls out to his son to call the mechanic shop and ask how long it would take to order parts. After a moment, the son calls back and says that the mechanic says it'll be about two or three days. The farmer then goes into his shed, muttering about how the fuel line was fine yesterday. Mr. Ages is disappointed. He thought the missing fuel line and hose clamp would give them much more time, and he's not sure what else to do. The two of them depart from the tractor. When they reach the field, Mr. Ages gives the baking soda to Mrs. Brisby, and the two of them part ways. Later that day, Mrs. Brisby sits atop the rock near her house. She's accompanied by three of her four children, Martin, the eldest, Teresa, the second eldest, and Cynthia, the youngest. Mrs. Brisby is drying herself off, as it's clear that she just finished washing herself off from the gas smell, as she's telling her children what happened with the tractor. After she's done, Martin exclaims how awesome his mother is, saying he's gonna tell everybody about what happened. Mrs. Brisby smiles, admitting that the neighbors might find it a little hard to believe. I bet Dad would believe you, says Cynthia, holding the necklace while Mrs. Brisby dried off. She dons a somber smile. I'm, I'm sure he would too, dear. Cynthia hands back the necklace to her mother, who places it back on. Teresa says that the Auntie Shrew had, uh, passed out after running around telling the neighbors about moving day, and Mrs. Brisby tells her children to go look after her while she sits out in the sun to try to dry off a little more. Time passes. The sun is now directly overhead. Mrs. Brisby is twiddling the metal hose clamp in her hands as she stares off towards the farm shed. Look of unease on her face. As a writer, you could leave this scene as it is, her staring off in the distance in contemplation. Perhaps a small flashback sequence where she's remembering a time or a memory with her husband Jonathan. Perhaps the day that they met, the day they fell in love, or maybe how Jonathan always told her stories about things that he had learned. Do you have an idea for this? Let me know how you'd write this scene in the comments below. I always love reading other story ideas. Mrs. Brisby sits in silence for a few moments. Suddenly, Jeremy lands beside her and greets her, and she's happy to see a friendly face, but is confused why he's there. Jeremy says that he saw her signal and came as soon as he could, gesturing to the hose clamp in her hands. She apologizes. She didn't mean to distract him like that. She's just... She sighs. Jeremy notices that she looks sad and asks what's wrong. She tells Jeremy about the situation and is wondering what her husband would do in this situation. Jeremy's unsure what to say, but he tells Mrs. Brisby that when most birds are looking for guidance, they seek an audience with the great owl. Mrs. Brisby has heard of this owl, but never considered that an option. After all, owls eat mice, but her family's lives are on the line, and after a moment of thinking about it, she asks if Jeremy would take her to see the great owl. Okay, let's talk about the stuff that we just did. The main reason why I want Mrs. Brisby to take down the tractor is because it adds a little bit more to her character in the story. The shrew taking down the tractor seems really out of character from the Don Bluth film. On the other hand, however, I also thought the book's description of the tractor just breaking down was too convenient. Having Mrs. Brisby doing this action shows that she's willing to do what needs to be done to save her family. Rather than her just being Mrs. Jonathan Brisby, we're giving her something else to her name that's tied to her actions. 
This mouse, being the widow of Jonathan Brisby, earns the condolences of the rats. This mouse, speaking with the great owl, earns the rats' respect. But when they find out that this is the mouse who sabotaged the tractor, the rosebush rats are going to give their undivided attention and support. And this is an element that will also be brought up again when we get to the rosebush. For now, we follow Jeremy and Mrs. Brisby as they go into the deep forest to find the great owl. The Great Owl scene in the movie and the book are pretty synonymous with each other. They both have their intimidation factor, as well as showcasing how wise the owl can be. The difference is, in the novel, it's Jeremy who actually introduces Mrs. Frisbee to the owl. And only when Jeremy says that he owes her his life does the owl actually agree to speak with Mrs. Frisbee in private. I'm not really going to change a lot with this scene. I think if you pulled influence from either one of them, it would be fine. The only thing I will change is that when the owl brings up the concept that Mrs. Brisby should go see the rats, she acknowledges that she's seen weird rats around the farmhouse, to which the owl tells her that they are located in the rosebush, and that she needs to ask for Justin, and he will take her to see a man named Nicodemus. If you have a version or a variation of the great owl scene that you'd like to have in this version, let me know what you do. Perhaps it's a different take on how the great owl looks or speaks, something of that nature. Feel free to comment your ideas with how you do this scene. There's a really important scene from the novel that was missing from the film that I'm actually going to bring forward, which is showing Mrs. Brisby going home and telling her children about seeing the great owl. Mrs. Brisby then goes into Timothy's room and finds that he's sitting up in bed, staring out the window. This is why I showed Timothy's fever breaking, and this allows him to become an active member in the story. In the novel, Timothy is aware moving day is nearby. He can smell the frost melting, and he remembers this smell from last year. He admits that he's tried to get up and walk, but his legs are too weak and he just becomes dizzy after a few steps. He realizes that he can't stay like this for much longer because he knows that when the plow comes, he won't be able to leave. He tells his mother not to worry and that he's going to focus on getting better and they'll deal with it when the time comes. This scene is really important for two main reasons. First, we get to have K Timothy as a character within the narrative, something the film didn't really do. He has one line of dialogue in the film. Second, it illustrates something that the book and movie could have shown a little bit more. Jonathan influence and teaching to his children. In this rewrite, the only thing I really want to change with this scene is to actually have Timothy holding a book open that his father had actually written about the plants that are nearby the house. Rather than just smelling the melted frost, Timothy says that his dad wrote about a flower that he can see out of his window and how you can use it to tell the time of year. It's a neat way to show that the kids are good readers, being both genetically capable as well as their father teaching them how. I feel like this kind of thing really rounds out the Brisby family as well as giving them reasons to converse and talk about their dad, which is something that was weird that it was never brought up in the film that I wanted to see if we couldn't fix that. I feel like doing this gives more characterization to the children as characters in this story. Next up, we're moving to the Rosebush. In particular, we're talking about the rat guard named Brutus. The conflict of Brutus in the novel and the film are staggeringly different. In the movie, Brutus is a tall, menacing, spear-wielding, voiceless rat that chases Mrs. Frizz be away from the rosebush, and once he's chased her away, we never see him again. In the novel, Brutus is still tall and menacing, but he acts as a proper guard, demanding that Frisbee de state her purpose of why she's there, and when she tries to say that she knows Justin, he asks how, and when she can't answer, he tells her to leave. Mrs. Frisbee begins to leave, only to have Aegis show up. Aegis in both the book as well as the novel have fairly similar reactions to hearing that Mrs. Frisbee went to go see the Great Owl. It's also here that we see that Mr. Aegis just has an injured leg, using a crutch to support himself. In the book, when we see Brutus again, he's accompanied by Justin. As a little side note, I always found this little part funny. In the book, which is written through Mrs. Frisbee's perspective, Justin is described as dark gray in color and extraordinarily handsome. Goodness me. Put this guy on the most handsome rat's magazine cover. This element is even driven home even more in the movie when Mrs. Frisbee is just captivated by this Justin character. Eyes batting and flat out calling the dude beautiful to his face than having to catch herself afterward. Calm down, Mrs. Brisby. You're on a mission, gosh darn it. I want to restage this scene with Brutus to follow more towards the novel. Brutus is still aggressive towards Mrs. Brisby when she can't tell how she knows Justin Nicodemus, but when Mr. Aegis shows up, he backs down from telling her to leave. Aegis formally introduces Brisby to Brutus. It takes a moment for it to sink in, but then he notices the necklace, and he immediately shifts gears and apologizes for being so abrasive. He starts talking about the farm 
cat for some reason, but Aegis just shushes him and asks why she was there. She explains to both of them that after the tractor was taken care of, she was visited by a friend. A fun line to throw in here is Bruce whispering to himself, Jonathan's wife is a saboteur? That makes so much sense. Brisby then says that her friend took her to see the Great Owl. Aegis and Brutus bug out as they say, You went to see the owl? Brisby explains that the owl told her to come here, find Justin, and talk to Nicodemus about her situation. Mr. Age's friendly demeanor breaks slightly when he calls her absolutely insane for going to the owl, but then remarks that not even the bravest rats would see the owl. He proves this by looking to Brutus and asking if he'd see the owl, to which Brutus replies, Of course not, it would eat me. Mr. Age's and Mrs. Brisby are given passage by Brutus, and Brutus gives one last comment to Mrs. Brisby, saying, Excellent job on the tractor, by the way, ma'am. And before she can reply, the door closes behind them, and they enter deeper into the depths of the Rosebush Colony, where they'll suddenly meet the aforementioned George Clooney of rats. The introduction of just in this reworking will follow a similar plot line to what we see in the film, just with a tad different situations. When Ages and Brisby enter the Rosebush Colony, they make their way into the main entrance, a place full of lights and technological devices. Mrs. Brisby's completely overwhelmed by seeing this place. Standing in the foyer is Justin, who's telling other rats who are carrying a large tape recorder to move it into the meeting room. If you decide to not have the recorder in your story, perhaps they're moving a collection of books. After the other rats leave, Justin turns to Ages and greets him with a welcoming look. He makes the comment, Ah, I see the farm trip had a few hiccups there, looking at Ages' leg. Justin's face then shifts to curiosity when he doesn't recognize the other mouse in the room, but then he sees the necklace. His eyes widen. Is this? Ages nods and introduces Mrs. Brisby to Justin, casually mentioning the tractor within the introduction. Justin's eyes widen. You mean Jonathan's wife is the saboteur? Mr. Ages nods. Yes, 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 one and the same. Has the meeting started yet? Justin didn't answer. Instead, he walks over to Mrs. Brisby and presents her with a graceful bow. It is truly an honor to meet you, ma'am. Mrs. Brisby, in this moment, just gazes at Justin in bewilderment. Holy moly, this is the most handsome rat she's ever seen. His eyes were dark maroon that twinkled in the lights. His fur was silky clean. He even smelled like a pine tree. Ages clears his throat and asks about the meeting again. Justin says that the meeting was moved because Nicodemus wants to make sure that he's prepared for the whole plan presentation. I suggest it's note cards, but I don't think he'll use them. Justin says that Nicodemus is in the library. Justin then escorts Mrs. Brisby and Mr. Ages down a collection of hallways. The moment they walk in, the pathway is suddenly illuminated. Every time the light kicks on, Mrs. Brisby would jump a little bit, but not out of fear, just more spooked than anything. Justin and Ages do their best to explain to Mrs. Brisby that it uses a type of sensor that kicks the electricity on. Justin explains that they don't want to light areas that are empty, especially when they feel bad about stealing the electricity from the farmer already. As they move throughout the rosebush tunnels, they run into different rats along the way. She is introduced to these other rats and then being connected to the events of the tractor. But Mrs. Brisby notices that many of the rats refer to her as something called the saboteur. She finally asks Justin and Mr. Ages why everyone was calling her that, embarrassed to admit that she's not entirely sure what it means. Mr. Ages chuckles. It comes from the word sabotage, meaning to deliberately destroy something. They're just excited to meet the one who did the number on the tractor. After walking a little bit more and running into a few more rats, they finally reach a set of doors, and they arrive at the library. Mrs. Brisby is taken in by the sheer number of books in the room, but before she can look around any more, she is stopped by Justin and Mr. Ages, who are then approached by a large rat. A rat named Jenner. Jenner in the movie is way more antagonistic than he ever was in the novel. In the novel, he was a survivor of Nim that we only see in a flashback sequence. We never actually meet him in the narrative with Mrs. Frisbee. Jenner is written as the opposite of Nicodemus. Nicodemus wants to move the rats to Thorn Valley to start anew, while Jenner never understood why exactly they would ever need to do that. This was actually something that was also brought up from that school loader that I mentioned before, where the students had then asked the producers why Jenner was turned evil for the film adaptation. The producers replied, quote, In the book, Jenner was actually a traitor who simply leaves. In the film, he becomes a more dramatic figure by being the visible enemy. In this version, I don't want to make Jenner the antagonist, at least not in the traditional <laughs> kind of enemy. Instead, I want to make him more as a counterbalance Nicodemus and really show how their two ideals don't work and have him in the story just for a little bit longer. When Justin, Mr. Ages, and Mrs. Brisby r arrive at the library, they're greeted by Jenner, a light gray rat covered in scars that show his pink skin underneath his fur. Jenner, just 
Justin begins. I'm sure we could figure out something out. Jenner has a deep, rattling voice as he holds a hand to Justin. There's nothing more to say, Justin. I can't change my mind any more than he can change his. He looks over his shoulder at Nicodemus, who stands at the other side of the library. Jenner looks back to Justin, but his eyes pivot down to look at Mrs. Brisby. Your new face. Justin gestures to Mrs. Brisby, formally introducing her to Jenner. He, too, also mentions the tractor in the introduction. Jenner's stern face lifts a little, and he bows his head to Mrs. Brisby. Your husband seems to leave quite an influence on those he meets. He left an influence on us all. Jenner turns back to Justin. I'll be attending the meeting to make my final statements to the colony. Jenner makes one last glance at Mrs. Brisby before turning away and leaving the library. Brisby turns to Ages, about to ask who that was, but then the voice of Nicodemus is heard. Justin? Mr. Ages? I see you've brought a guest. The version of Nicodemus in the Don Bluth film is, well, enchanting. Pun very much intended. He's gracious, kind, barely ever speaks higher than a whisper. As spooky as he can look, he's a very welcoming character. Both the film and book variations of Nicodemus have similar characteristics the real differences are aesthetic ones. In the film, he's a magic user and is noticeably older than all the other characters, while in the novel, he's very intelligent, whose face and body were covered in scars and wore the eye patch over an eye, and uses a magnifying glass to read things. While he's clearly older than most of the rats, if he and Mr. Ages were put next to one another, it's clear that they'd be close in age. For this rewrite, I'm going to utilize the novel version of Nicodemus. The trio walk over to Nicodemus, Mrs. Brisby's follow closely behind. So he looks around this new area of the library, which is separated by another set of double doors, and is full of wires and weird-looking contraptions scattered all over. Nicodemus stood at the far wall in front of a blackboard covered in words and illustrations. Mrs. Brisby looks to the left wall and sees that it's full of books and papers, neatly organized. It was the right wall that was confusing her. It appeared to be a giant sheet of black glass, almost like a mirror, but the reflection was askew from the shape of the glass. I had a feeling we'd be seeing you, Mrs. Brisby. Be, says Nicodemus, walking around the table and shaking her hand. She notices that, much like Jenner, Nicodemus is also covered in scars and marks. Justin comments that this is the one who dealt with the tractor, as well as that this mouse is also the one that had an audience with the great owl. Nicodemus beams at Mrs. Brisby. My word, you have been busy. To say Jonathan left an influence on you would be a vast understatement. Mrs. Brisby's curiosity finally breaks. How, how is it that everyone here knows about Jonathan. Nicodemus offers a seat to Mrs. Brisby. Jonathan was a great friend to us. He was able to help us in many different ways in our times of need. If it wasn't for him, none of us would be here today. Mrs. Brisby admits that she doesn't entirely understand. If you wanted to keep the journal in the story, a neat reveal you could do here is to have Nicodemus's journal kept in a section in this area under a large box with a string. When Mrs. Brisby opens the book, the pages are blank. Nicodemus pulls on the string, and the hanging box box above opens and a cascade of cold fog drops down onto the book. Before her eyes, the words appear and she's able to read the journal. Turns out what's hanging above there is possibly like an ice box or even a refrigeration unit. It makes for a nice sciency moment that adds a little misdirection that would definitely be perceived as magical from Mrs. Brisby. For now, I'll continue with Nicodemus using the voice recorder for his notes. Nicodemus walks over to a box of some kind with buttons all over it and he presses one of them. To Mrs. Brisby's shock, Nicodemus's voice can be heard but it wasn't wasn't coming from him, it was coming from the box. It is with a heavy heart that I make this chronicle known for the record. Mr. Ages has successfully made a mixture that will render the farm cat unconscious for a remarkable six hours. More than enough time we need to move resources, but today also was met with a heart-shattering result. Jonathan volunteered to place the mixture to the cat's food bowl. He had made a successful trip to the bowl, but his return was met by the claws of dragon. The voice shakes. Tears fill Mrs. Brisby's eyes as she looks around at the others in the room. Justin looking at the floor, Ages has his face in his hands, and Nicodemus stands with his hand on the box, his head lowers as his show workers are shaking from the memory. The voice begins again. Jonathan's act of bravery is something that none of us will ever be able to repay. We lost one of our own today. His actions shall be remembered by all those who knew him. There was a moment of silence. Justin says that Jonathan made him promise that the necklace 
necklace was given to Mrs. Brisby. She holds the necklace in her hands as the tears finally fall. I'm sorry this was kept from you, Mr. Aegis says. Mrs. Brisby looks around at Justin and Nicodemus, asking why Jonathan never spoke of the rats. There's a pause. Nicodemus takes a deep breath and begins to speak. We used to be ordinary rats, Mrs. Brisby, stealing scraps, sleeping wherever was most comfortable. Justin twists a small dial on the wall, and the room lights dim. Nicodemus walks over to the glass wall. It was a simpler time for a simpler mind. Nicodemus raises his walking stick off the ground. But just as one day turns the next, our world was changed in an instant. As he taps the walking stick to the ground, the glass wall suddenly becomes illuminated. Mrs. Brisby gasps at the sight, almost toppling out of her chair. The light was a collection of dots, frantically moving around the glass, which then shift to an image of a room full of cages. Nicodemus turns to her. This is the story of the survivors of Nim. The story Nicodemus tells Mrs. Brisby remains mostly unchanged from the novel and the film. The film version obviously is more slimmed down for time's sake, so details about what happened at Nim go mostly unknown. For example, the intelligence of the rats and mice in the novel are explained that it, they've been there for many months and were taught to read by the scientists. The escape from Nim was something that Nicodemus, Justin, and Jenner worked on for weeks before they made a break for it. Including it in this rework also makes it so that their intelligence wasn't a miracle like it was in the film. They put effort into becoming smarter. In this version, rather than the magical exposition orb seen from the film, Nicodemus now stands in front of a large television screen and recaps the story of Nim. That's what the Wall of Light is. It's a large television screen, and Nicodemus is controlling it by tapping a remote on the ground. It's the nice little misdirection that I was talking about before. Mrs. Brisby isn't looking at the ground, she's looking at Nicodemus or this giant wall of light. We might be able to see the remote in a wide shot, but we're never pulled focus to it. Nicodemus is using a combination of laboratory security footage as well as some personal videos taken by the scientists to document the progression of the rats and mice while they were given their injections. I could go into great detail of how the rats could have gotten the footage, but I think this video is going to be far too long as it is. Perhaps they just went back for the footage or maybe they took it with them when they escaped. Who knows? Got any ideas? Leave them in the comments. It's here we learn that the mice learned about chemistry. In the novel, the rats and mice were kept in different areas of the lab. When the mice joined the rats for the escape, two of them stand out, being Mr. Ages, an older mouse, and Jonathan, a much younger mouse. And they are the only two mice that actually tie themselves down to the rats so that they all don't get lost during the escape. Mr. Ages explains that Jonathan and himself were kept in a different container that wasn't locked, because the scientists thought that they were too small to climb out. Jonathan admits that they must have thought that they couldn't have stood on each other's shoulders to get out. Ages explains that they would watch the scientists do all kinds of chemical and elemental experimentations during the day, and during the night, the two mice would climb out and do experiments of their own. One day, one of the mice ended up dying. The mouse was removed from its cage, and the latch to the cage was placed on the table near Jonathan and Mr. Ages. That night, they used the chemicals and elements that they could get their hands on and did tests on the latch, and they were able to dissolve the latch in a way that it could be snapped by brute force. They had heard through the ventilation systems one night that the rats were going to be planning an escape, so they lined up their own escape to join up with the rats. It was Justin who then noticed that Jonathan was holding a small red object in a clear case, and inquires what it is. Just as Jonathan begins to explain, they all stop. There was a rumbling noise coming from the vent. The other mice's choice to not heed Nicodemus's warning results in nine of them being blown away into the ventilation unit, never to be heard from again, leaving just Mr. Ages and Jonathan of the mice of Nim. And just like in both versions, they make it to the roof, they're blocked by a gate, Jonathan squeezes through, unlatches it, and sets them free. Making the mice chemists can be viewed as a small change or a large change, depending on how you think of it. I think it adds depth to the two surviving mice that builds on who they are and what we already knew about them, being Mr. Ages making the sleeping mixture for the farm cat. Now, in the movie, after they escape, that's where the story from Nicodemus ends. In the novel, they keep explaining about how they traveled all over finding place to live and wanting to expand their knowledge. One of the places they find is a place called the Boniface Estate, a place they lived for eight months and took advantage of the library in the estate to feed their growing intelligence. It presents an interesting narrative moment that we can use to show how the rats and the mice focus their talents. While the rats build prototypes of machines and devices, the mice dived into the intricacies of different kinds of chemistry. The rats create a pulley system to move things around the living room, while the mice are in the kitchen learning how to bake and cook food, leading them to eventually find a medicine cabinet and test all the different kind of things that they find in there. They document what they know, and what they don't know, they do tests with. Perhaps we hear about how the mice were able to utilize this practice of medicine by saving Nicodemus and Jenner from their horrid injuries, one of them leaving Nicodemus's eye to be covered 
up. They assess the injuries and are able to use ginger extract to slow the bleeding while witch hazel to both stabilize the bleeding areas and disinfect them while binding themselves up. The rats are able to stabilize and are left with the scars that we see them with now. These things are never addressed in either the novel or the book, so it's cool to see what we can try to do to make it altogether new. Nicodemus finishes the story and says that the rats will help move the Brisby house, but first, they must attend the meeting to finalize the final stages of the plan. Mrs. Brisby inquires what exactly the plan was. Nicodemus taps his walking stick to the ground and the wall turns off and the room lights return. He explains that they want to move to Thorn Valley so that the rats no longer had to steal resources and how they now have the ability to live off the land. Nicodemus admits it's a drastic change, but it's something that needs to be done. I want to pay homage to the Don Bluth line from the film by having Nicodemus say the following. Mrs. Brisby, after the things we've been through and the knowledge we've gained, we can no longer live as rats. We've learned too much. With that, the four of them depart the library. At the meeting, Nicodemus and Jenner share the stage. Nicodemus steps forward and gives his presentation about moving to Thorn Valley, giving a breakdown of how they can farm and harness energy from the nearby creek and successfully live without stealing. After he's done, he steps back and Jenner steps forward and addresses the colony. His speech is about understanding that the world will never see them as anything but rats. It is with this assumption by the rest of the world that we can live anywhere we need to for generations to come. I say why start from nothing when we have everything? We have a civilization, a place to call home, and our wits about us. He tells the rats that if they want to go to Thorn Valley, go, and those who want to stay should reconvene with him in the dining hall, and they'll discuss about how they will rebuild the rosebush after the others leave for Thorn Valley. There's a whisper of dialogue between a collection of rats within the room. Jenner leaves, and with him, a small collection of rats depart. After a moment, Nicodemus gestures to Justin, Mr. Ages, and Mrs. Brisby to join him on stage. He addresses to the colony that tomorrow night they will be helping Jonathan's family move their home so that it will be safe from the plow. A few more hushed voices repeat Jonathan's name throughout the crowd. This mouse has been to the great owl, and he instructed her to come to us for help. The colony rumbles with bewilderment. Nicodemus raises a hand in the colony silences. Justin gestures to Mrs. Brisby. And before she did that, this is the mouse that took down the Fitzgibbon's plow. The words Jonathan's wife, Great Owl, and Saboteur ripple through the crowd. Nicodemus states that because Mr. Ages is injured, they'll need a volunteer to drug the farm cat so the house can be moved. The colony falls silent. Hushed whispers fill the air. Just as Justin is about to raise his hand, Mrs. Brisby steps forward. I'll do it, Justin says. No, no, Mrs. Brisby, that wouldn't be right. I should be the one who... Mrs. Brisby holds a hand to him, staring intently at Nicodemus. I came to you for help. If Jonathan made it possible for all of you to escape from Nim, let me finish what he started. Nicodemus and Mrs. Brisby lock eyes. After a moment, Nicodemus looks out over the colony. He calls out, as long as we have luck, and the entire colony answered back, we will never be stuck. Nicodemus looks back to Mrs. Brisby as tears filled her eyes upon hearing her husband's signature say. Justin places a hand on Mrs. Brisby's shoulder, saying that the two of them will meet tomorrow at dusk at the farmhouse to drug the farm cat. Nicodemus taps his walking stick to the ground, and in an instant, the rest of the colony disperse in one movement. The trip to the farmhouse to drug the farm cat remains pretty much unchanged from both the novel and the Don Bluth film. Justin meets her, goes over the instructions for the plan. We'll take the scene from the film where Justin runs over the strategy where Mrs. Brisby leaves her shawl and the necklace with Justin. She is able to carry out the drugging, but gets caught under a strainer by the farm son and is placed in an empty birdcage. Time passes, she listens to the farmers converse at dinner about how a local mechanic shop had found a collection of rats that were electrocuted to death. The farmer says the mechanic swore it looked like the rats were trying to steal the battery. Mrs. Brisby makes the assumption that that must have been Jenner's group that departed yesterday. Just then, the phone rings, and the farmer answers it. Pardon? Oh, Nim! Yeah, I remember you sent that pamphlet in the mail asking if we had rats on our farm. Oh well, yeah, we got a large bunch of them in a rose bush, but I can't say I know it's anything strange. Uh-huh. Uh, hold on one second. The farmer then asks his wife if she would be okay with the rose bush being cut down. She sighs, but says if it gets rid of those confounded rats, so be it. The farmer then tells the Nim caller that he'll see them in the morning. Mrs. Brisby's heart sinks. She's gotta find a way out of here to warn the rats and fast. She waited until the Fitzgibbons had left for bed. And 
and she tries everything to get out. The lock was out of reach, the bars were too thin to squeeze through. She tries to push the water trough out to make an opening, but it's locked down from the outside. What is she gonna do? Mrs. Brisby, are you up there? She runs to the side of the cage and looks down to see Mr. Aegis is hobbling along the tile floor. He calls up and says that Justin had ran to help with the moving of the house and told Aegis to come to help Mrs. Brisby get out of the cage. Mrs. Brisby takes an old sock and pulls out a long string and tosses it down to Aegis on the floor. He tries to climb himself up, but he can't hoist himself. He instead ties his satchel to the string and has Mrs. Brisby bring it to her. He calls up to her and asks what she has at her disposal in the cage. She lists off the trough of water, an old sock, a paper on the floor, a small mirror, and a small blade of breadcrumbs. After a pause, Aegis calls out to remove some items from his bag. She pulls out a wad of cotton, a small vial of clear liquid, and a small wooden clothespin from the bag. Aegis says that she's going to rub the cotton that is going to be soaked in the clear liquid on the door latch, which should dissolve it enough to where she could force it open. She does this, but the metal doesn't react. Aegis thinks that the cage might be made of something else, some other kind of metal. Mrs. Brisby looks around at anything that could be different and then sees the cage is supported by a chain attached to the ceiling. She calls out that she's going to try going for the chain. Mr. Aegis protests that that could cause a lot of noise, but Mrs. Brisby says there isn't enough time to argue. Mr. Aegis tells her to hold for a moment, and he runs over and with all of his might is pulling a sheet of towels over from the other side of the room and places it underneath the cage. He tells her that she should dip the wad of cotton fully in the vial of this clear liquid and stuff it into the chain and that she should immediately wrap herself in the sock so that way she doesn't get hurt. She climbs up to the top of the cage and shoves the cotton into the chain with the clothespin, which instantly begins making a hissing noise. She drops down and hides in the sock. There's a brief moment before the chain bends and snaps. And while the towel did help with the noise, the sound was still monstrous. Mr. Aegis looks looks up at the ceiling to hear footsteps. He runs over to the cage as Mrs. Brisby emerges from the sock and the two of them are now able to escape. Just as they dive back underneath the kitchen cabinets, they hear the farmer walk into the room and go, ah, jeez, now the bird cage. <sighs> Everything's falling apart around here. Mr. Ages returns the necklace and her shawl to Mrs. Brisby, about to comment how close that was, but Mrs. Brisby stops him. We have to see Nicodemus. Now, the moving of the house is actually going to be a fusion from both the novel as well as the film. In the film, they're using an elaborate pulley system and hoist the house way up high and move it over a distance. In the novel, they're using a complex series of ropes and logs that are stationed on the ground as they are able to roll the house along the logs. In this version, they're using the pulley system, but they're only hovering a little bit over the ground, using the logs as a countermeasure in case anything goes wrong. Brisby and Aegis run across the field as fast as they can. On the way, Mrs. Brisby slides across a log and the necklace snaps on a twig and it falls to the ground. She picks up the necklace and continues to run. There's no time to waste. They arrive to the house to see how slowly the house is being moved to the pulley system. Mrs. Brisby sees her children are having a wonderful time peering through the windows at the action outside. Nicodemus and Justin see Mrs. Brisby and are relieved to see she's all right. Justin begins to say that the children are enjoying the move, but Mrs. Brisby stops him. She's been thinking about this the entire time they've ran here. She looks at how far the house has been moved. If she tells the rats that the scientists are arriving in the morning, they would need to leave the house where it was so that they could pack up the rose bush. But at the pace the move was going, if she waited until after the house fully moved, the rats might not have enough time to leave. Leaving the rats could be killed or captured. It tears her up inside, but... She tells the rats of Nim that the scientists will be coming in a few hours. It sends a ripple throughout the rats. They argue and bicker whether or not they should finish the move or return to the rosebush to leave. The house, no longer being supported or moved by the rats, lowers onto the logs underneath. Nicodemus tries calling out to the rats, but no one's listening. Mrs. Brisby moves over to the house, staring out at the arguing rats. She looks at her children through the window who have concerned looks. She slumps at the edge of the house onto the side of the cinder block and looks at the necklace in her hands. Tears fill her eyes. What had she done but cause more trouble? What was she gonna do? The sounds of the arguing rats are drowned out as she stares at the necklace in her hands. After a pause, she gets to her feet and looks at the side of the cinder block house. She places a free hand on the side of the block. She leans into the house. She places the other hand on the house. She leans a little bit more. The necklace slips from her hand and falls to the ground. She picks it up and places it in her teeth, continuing to push onto the side of the house with all of her might. Justin and Mr. Ages walk over to her. 
sure. Mrs. Brisby, says Justin. I, I know this looks bad, but I'm sure we can think of something. I'm sure we will. But Mrs. Brisby doesn't answer. Her eyes are locked in the space of block between her hands on the wall. Her feet are digging into the ground as her teeth become biting down even harder. Mr. Hages gasps as he looks at her. A small trickle of red was oozing out from her clenched teeth. Mrs. Brisby, stop! You're hurting yourself! He steps forward to try to stop her, but freezes. The arguing rats suddenly stop as they hear a noise. They look towards Mrs. Brisby and freeze as they witness what's happening. Mr. Ages and Justin take a few steps back, their eyes bugged out of their heads as the sight of Mrs. Brisby moving the house. It was small, only a few millimeters, but this mouse was moving the cinder block by herself. The logs proving this as they're slowly rotating as they're moving along. For a moment, everyone stood dumbfounded. Nicodemus instructs a handful of rats to go back to the rose bush and start to move things out. Nicodemus turns to the remaining rats and hollers at them to help out. The first to stand beside Mrs. Brisby is Justin, followed by Brutus, then four rats, then ten, then twenty, then thirty. The rest of the colony was pushing the block while some of them grabbed the rope to guide the block around the corner to the place where the house needed to go. As the house is moving along, the rats would remove the last exposed log and move it out in front of the house so it could continue the roll. The rats are chanting, we have luck, we won't be stuck. We have luck, we won't be stuck. After an intense slug of effort, the house makes it all the way to its final resting place on the leeward side of the stone. The rats cheer and hoop and holler. Nicodemus calls out to the rats, telling him to go back to the rose bush to dismantle anything that they can. Justin and Mr. Ages stand next to Mrs. Brisby, who still has her hands planted on the side of the house. Mrs. Brisby, we did it. Justin says, your, your family is safe now. He places a hand on her shoulder, but she doesn't react. He gently shakes her. The necklace falls out of her mouth and she blinks. She looks around. We did it? Mr. Ages bends down and picks up the necklace. She looks at Mr. Ages. You brought luck. Mr. Ages smiles grandly, and you became unstuck. Mrs. Brisby pushes herself off of the wall and nearly falls over from being dizzy, but Justin catches her from falling. After a moment, she's able to stand on her own. Nicodemus walks over with a beaming smile. You Brisbys are one in a million, you know. Justin helps Mrs. Brisby so that she can go and check on her children. Ages holds the necklace in his hands. Nicodemus walks over to him. He always said it would come in handy. Mr. Ages turns the casing to see that Mrs. Brisby had bitten through it. A little puncture mark on the back, and out dropped a little driplet of red. I don't know what that was, Ages says. This catatolamine is nearly five years old might not be as potent as it once was. Nicodemus and Mr. Ages look through the window of the house as Mrs. Brisby is embracing her children. Perhaps it was the strength of a mother who needed to do what needed to be done. Mr. Ages reaches into his satchel and pulls out a piece of tape and covers the puncture hole on the necklace. For now, I think I'm going to leave that unanswered. Nicodemus smiles. Makes sense to me. Justin and Mrs. Brisby return. Mrs. Brisby says that the children are thankful for the rats, helping them out. Nicodemus turns to Justin. We still have a lot of work to do. We don't know when those scientists could arrive. Justin scratches his chin as he thinks. We could close and lock the gate to the farm. It could slow them down at least a little bit. Nicodemus agrees, but would it be enough? The sun slowly rises on the horizon. The farmer's gonna be on his plow. He'd see the truck and let them in. We can only hope he doesn't carry his gate key around. Mrs. Brisby and Mr. Age's ears perk up at the word plow. They glance at one another, smile, and look back at Nicodemus. I think we have a plan. The rats look at the mice. Oh? Mr. Age's points towards the rose bush. I'll need you to find me the schematics for a car engine. Mrs. Brisby looks out at the sun that rises over the trees, casting light over them. And I'll need something shiny. Inside the necklace is an experimental version of a chemical known as catatolamine. If you know your chemical names, you know that catatolamine is one of the many names for epinephrine or adrenaline. Is it one-to-one -one version with adrenaline that you could find and research and study today? Probably not. Many experimental elements that get tested and don't pass certain tests never see the light of day. Perhaps it worked in mice trials, but didn't work in human trials. Is it possible that Mrs. Brisby was able to harness this boost of strength to push her house? Maybe. Adrenaline rushes don't give you supernatural abilities, but the increase in oxygen into your bloodstream caused your muscles to go into overdrive. Perhaps it was hysterical strength of a mother trying to save her family. We've heard stories of people lifting cars off of family members who were trapped. Perhaps it's something along those lines. Maybe it was a combination of both of these elements that gave this tiny mouse the ability to ever so slightly move a cinder block house. 
house, just enough to inspire others to take action. I'm pulling a lot of visual reference for this scene from the 1997 Studio Ghibli film Princess Mononoke, where the protagonist is able to push open a gate that normally takes 10 men to open with a single hand while seriously injured. It allows the audience to discover what they want it to be, the catatolamine or mother's determination, or both. Your perception of Mrs. Brisby is what allows your characterization of her as a character in this narrative to be what you need it to be. Farmer Fitzgibbons is working on the tractor. After a while of rummaging around, he notices a white van with National Institute of Mental Health on the side parked at the gate, a group of people standing out in front of the van. As he makes his way down the long driveway, he notices a crow perched atop the sign for the farm with string around its belly. He opens the gate and converses with one of the people who explain that their engine to the van just died when they arrived. Farmer Fitzgibbons looks around the engine and pulls out a rubber tube and chuckles. Well, there's your problem. Your engine fuel line fell out because the hose clamp must have come loose. He looks around and under the van. Ah, it must have fallen out a while back. Don't worry, I got a few spares I just ordered today. Mrs. Brisby and Jeremy quietly laugh as Mrs. Brisby holds the van's missing hose clamp in her hands. They take off the sign towards the field. The farmer and the scientist get behind the van and push it towards the house. After a while, they get to the house and the scientists go to work around the bush. They cut it down and find a few holes, a couple of nests, and a few pieces of string, but nothing out of the ordinary. The scientists tell the farmer that they're going to do a few more tests. Farmer just shrugs and says, half at it. He walks into his shed, hops on his tractor, and turns the key, but the tractor doesn't start. Farmer gets off the tractor and rants about how he lost another hose clamp, for goodness sake! Just as Mr. Ages and Auntie Shrew run out from under the tractor, out of the shed, and towards the field. Jeremy is perched atop the rock as a lookout. Mrs. Brisby stands in front of her house. A small collection of rats, including Nicodemus, Justin, and Brutus, stand at the edge of the tall grass in front of the house. The three children sit on top of the house, while Timothy can be seen looking through the window. Ages hobbles out from the tall grass, holding a different kind of hose clamp with Auntie Shrew, who's going on and on about how she never wants to go near the tractor again. She sees the rats, gives a harumph, then leaves. Nicodemus steps forward towards Mrs. Brisby. One and a million, he says. Justin steps forward and shakes Mrs. Brisby's hand. Jonathan would be proud what you've done for us today. Mrs. Brisby smiles. I'm sure he'd be happy to know you're all making it to Thorn Valley. Brutus walks over with a small wagon full of books. We, we thought your family would enjoy these. Uh, some of them were Jonathan's favorite. Mr. Ages walks over to Mrs. Brisby and hands back her necklace, which is now sitting inside of a larger case with a different chain. Teresa asks if the rats would come visit them someday. Justin says, of course, we'll always make time for Jonathan's family. Cynthia asks if they'd come by tomorrow. <laughs> Nicodemus chuckles with some of the rats. Soon. We promise we'll come visit soon. Martin asks, Hey, Mom, you think that the we could possibly go out to Thorn Valley to visit them? Mrs. Brisby looks to Martin. I'm sure we'd find our way out there someday. Timothy taps on the window and yells, Wait till I'm better, okay? Everyone shares a small laugh. Nicodemus raises an eyebrow and looks towards Mrs. Brisby. I feel silly having to admit this, but I don't think we ever caught your name. Mrs. Brisby smiles. She takes a step forward and extends a hand to Nicodemus. Elizabeth. Nicodemus smiles and takes her hand and gently shakes it. Until we meet again, Elizabeth Brisby. With that, the rats say their goodbyes and disappear into the tall grass. Mrs. Brisby looks at the necklace in her hands and removes the chain from the necklace and ties it around the hose clamp she got from the van. She looks up at Jeremy. I think this should go to the lucky lady you made that nest for. As she then tosses the hose clamp and chain towards Jeremy, who catches it in his beak. Oh, thank you, Mrs. B. I, I promise I'll introduce her whenever I find her. Jeremy, giggling with glee, takes off from the rock and disappears into the tree line in the distance. The children climb down from the top of the house and make their way inside, Mrs. Brisby following after. She places the necklace in the windowsill, which twinkles in the sunlight, dancing from the tall grass, being blown gently by the new coming spring breeze. And just like that, we've come to the end of this surgery. It was a long one, but I've been wanting to do this proper rewrite for The Secret of Nim for a long time time. It still is one of my favorite films of my childhood, and I will always hold it in high regard. I feel the changes we made here emphasize the potential of the narrative seen in both the original novel and the Don Bluth film. We get to witness how Mrs. Brisby sees the world around her. Our perception of the mice that survived Nim is given new potential and opens up a world of opportunities, and the necklace now has new meaning and purpose in the story, whose contents might seem like a magical potion to a child, but is something that, once you get older and more knowledgeable, you might understand understand what it is and how it connects to the world that this story lives in. I'm sure some would probably think that the story crafted here still has some issues that were echoes of the original problems I said
said were in the original Don Bluth film, and that's perfectly fair. My goal was just to see if we couldn't find a way of retelling the story from the novel in a way that stuck to the scientific roots that the novel brought forward, while also paying homage to the cult classic film brought to millions of people around the world that is held in such high regards. My goal was to create a story that focuses on our main character in a new way that showcases her strength and capabilities. Mrs. Frisbee is a strong, influential character within literature, and I wanted to take that element and strengthen it even more to show how she can tackle any problem that comes her way. She might not have the intelligence of the rats, or the chemistry prowess of her husband, but she will do whatever she can to protect her family, face unspeakable dangers, challenge her own will, and never lose sight of what's important. Sometimes we make our own luck to make us unstuck, and maybe, just maybe, love is the key that can unlock any door. Hello everyone, and thank you for watching this episode of Story Surgery. The script for this one originally was 49 pages long. I was able to shrink it all down to about 29 pages, in which case it then took me about two hours to actually record it, and then edit it all down to about an hour and 17 minutes long. Oof! This was an episode I've wanted to do for a very long time for one of my favorite films from my childhood. Again, like I stated at the beginning of this video, it was never meant to be a video that rips into this story and tells a long tale about how it doesn't work. Instead, I just wanted to make a video seeing if I couldn't tackle something in a different way. If something was based off of a novel, what was a way that we could take the novel as well as the movie that was already adapted from it and see if we could make it into something altogether new? I came up with the concept for this particular video a long time ago, back when I was at university, and I finally was able to get around and make it here today. Like I also stated earlier, if you had any ideas or commentary on any of the things that we did during this episode, perhaps you had your own idea for something as seen anywhere along the lines, feel free to leave it in the comments below. Like I said, I really do take joy out of reading other people's ideas when it comes to the things that we rework for story surgery. But I'm not going to make this video any longer than it already is. It's already far too long and my brain hurts from all the editing stuff that I had to do for this one. So, once again, thank you very much for reaching all the way to the end of this video. My name is EPZ379, and I'll see you for the next operation.